right. Anybody hear me? Yes, OK. So I'd like to tell you about some of the work that's going on uh, in my lab in trying to understand the formation of, of the heart um, and using cellular models uh, to do so. So this is a, uh, an illustration by Leonardo da Vinci, who, uh, as both uh, an artist and an inventor, um, realized that the heart was a beautiful, complex machine and, and was sought to understand it. And, and so our lab tries to understand the many aspects of how the heart comes together um, to, to become this, this wonderful organ that's essential for life. And at the root of our interest is to really try to understand lineage decisions. How does a, a pluripotent cell become committed to a particular lineage and then get differentiated into various specialized cell types while at the same time uh, being formed into a three-dimensional functional organ. And uh, because this is sort of a, a special day and we have Sir John and Shinny here, I thought I'd, uh, I'd share with you uh, some quotes that, that, that uh, Sir John Gurdon um, made in an interview several years ago, which actually was very prescient for, for what is going on at this meeting. And he said, I see the end point of my own interest as being complete understanding in molecular terms of how differentiated cells appear. And he continued to say that we need to know the numbers of different molecules, where they are, and how long they spend interacting with each other, which is exactly what we've been trying uh, to do and what many people in this lab, uh, in this room, excuse me, uh, are, are doing. Um, and then he went on to say something I think quite extraordinary at the time in 2000. He said, when we really think we understand development, we should actually be able to take it backwards from the end right to the beginning and then send it out on a different route, which is exactly what Shinya managed to do and what all of us here in the room uh, have been doing uh, since then. So, Really what, 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 uh, what, these, what this quote illustrates is the need to really understand the, the, the genomic circuitry of a cell in a complete way. And I like to think of this as understanding the blueprint, the genomic blueprint of the cell. So this is a, a blueprint of a gyroscope from 1913. And if you want to build a gyroscope or if you want to fix a broken gyroscope that you might have hanging around, you would need a blueprint. And of course, this is a relatively simple blueprint. There are a lot more complicated blueprints, and, if, and a cell is a very complicated thing. And so we ask the, the simplistic question, what is the genomic blueprint of the heart? And we've taken a number of different approaches uh, to achieve that. And over the last uh, couple of decades, um, many labs, including ours and DPACs and, and others, have focused on, on individual transcription factors and have been able to, as illustrated in, in, in this uh, summary diagram from Eric Davidson's review in 2006, been able to put sort of simplistic networks of transcription factors. And over the years, we've realized that it's important to, to establish these, these networks because many of the transcription factors that we find in these networks are uh, genes that are involved in human congenital heart disease, as Deepak pointed out uh, yesterday. Um, and they're also the, the factors that are involved in, in this case, cardiac reprogramming, again, as, as Deepak told us about yesterday. But we still have a very limited understanding of, of, these, of these transcription factors and, and how they function and how the genome is coordinated um, in cardiac differentiation. Now, of course, when we think of DNA, we always draw a, a linear strand, and we think of, of uh, you know, linear DNA. But as we heard from uh, Catherine Plath yesterday, um, DNA is actually uh, wrapped in very densely in chromatin, in, in a dense 3D structure, wraps around nucleosomes that get uh, more, more densely packed. And this is a great packing mechanism to get DNA into a cell, but it creates a serious topological problem for anything that, that needs to get in there. Um, so, in case the movie didn't make the point, this, this is another way of looking at it. It's the Tokyo subway, and these, these guys are, are packing people into the subway to make sure t that they efficiently get to their destination. But this poor guy at the back of the train here, he, he needs to get off at the right stop. And so what, what evolution has done is, is used chromatin not just as a packaging mechanism, but also as a regulatory mechanism to be able to sort genes, turn them on and off at the right time in the right place. And so there's many different mechanisms to do this. Um, one of the mechanisms that, that most people are familiar with, which I'll be talking to you about, are the, the modifications of the unstructured tails of histones. And these come in a few broad flavors, these repressive marks that I've illustrated here in red, and these different types of active marks here in, in sort of green and blue. And of course, there's also chromatin modeling complexes, DNA transcription factors, and the regulated recruitment and elongation of RNA polymerase too. All these things are deeply integrated in regulating gene expression. 
And so what we set out to do is to try to understand all these levels of regulation across a time course of cardiac differentiation, from, from pluripotency to mesoderm to cardiac precursors, and finally into cardiac myocytes. And again, the question was, how are genes regulated at the level of chromatin during cardiac differentiation? And we knew that, that this would be important because we, we published uh, work um, earlier this year that showed that one of these epigenetic regulators, the polycom com complex, is important in cardiac precursors for repressing epigenetically the expression of very specific sets of genes. I'm showing you one important gene here, 6-1, and that if this gene is, n is not epigenetically repressed, it goes nuts and turns on all sorts of genes that are bad for cardiac myocytes, hypertrophy-associated genes, genes that promote fibrosis, and genes that belong to the wrong cell type, skeletal muscle genes instead of, of cardiac myocyte genes. And this has profound effects on the cellular homeostasis. So it's clearly very important to maintain this epigenetic regulation. And so back to this question, we wanted to then understand on a more broad, on a global scale, how all genes in the genome are regulated epigenetically. And so what I'm going to share with you is the work of a graduate student in the lab, Jeffrey Alexander. And, the, and this work is, was a very close collaboration with Lori Boyer's lab at MIT, in particular with a postdoc in her lab, Joe Wamstad. And we couldn't have done any of this work without all the computational people we have at Gladstone, so Alicia Holloway, who leads our, our bioinformatics core, and Rebecca Trudy and others in Katie Pollard's lab. And so the first thing we had to figure out is how to get the cells that we wanted to study. If we want to study cardiogenic mesoderm, well, we have to deal with embryos that are about a millimeter wide and that have only a couple hundred cells, and same thing for the other stages. It's a very uh, challenging thing to do. So, so what, we, what we turned to was a, a directed differentiation protocol um, that's been, that was developed in Gordon Keller's lab that basically using the addition of different molecules at different concentrations at different times mimics the, the conditions that a cell goes through in normal cardiac differentiation. And this is a wonderful protocol. Um, it's extremely efficient. If we look at, at the, the end point here in the cardiac myocytes, here you can see a, a field of cells that's been stained with cardiac troponin T, a cardiac marker. So most of the cells are expressing this cardiac marker. And of course, if you look in the dish, they're, they're doing their dance, they're, they're beating away. And we're getting routinely um, up to 90% now uh, cardiac myocytes in, in any differentiation. And for me, the, 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 the best part, as if the, you know, this wasn't good enough already, the best part is we can stop the differentiation along the way and capture the developmental intermediate, so the mesoderm, the precursors. And so we, we uh, very carefully defined the stages that we, want to look, that we wanted to look at. And, and I'm going to show these stages a lot, so I, so I just want to make it clear the, the nomenclature. Obviously, embryonic stem cells, ES cells, mesoderm stage, MES, cardiomyocyte precursors, CP, and functional cardiac myocytes, CMs. And so the first thing we did was to do RNA sequencing and to look at gene expression. I'm going to show you in the next slide a, uh, a heat map of the, the uh, what we, we found was, was really quite an amazing cardiac signature of, of gene expression. And it kind of looked like this. So, uh, no, that's not the right one. Um, that's the right one. That's, that's, what, that's what we saw. And this is showing you unsupervised clustering of RNA-seq data uh, for about 16,000 genes that are expressed in this time course. And this includes long endogenic non-coding RNAs and, and any sort of RNA that, that you can imagine. And it was very satisfying to see that, as shown here in the blue, blue is the higher expressed genes, that we could capture genes that were associated with pluripotency at the right stage, genes that were specific to, to the mesoderm stage, specific to the cardiac precursor stage, and of course, all the genes that we, that we know and love that are associated with cardiac structure and function. So we knew that our system uh, was working, was giving, capturing the right intermediates, and also was giving us this very rich data sets to, to understand uh, this differentiation process. And so the next thing that we did then is to do chromatin immun immunoprecipitation coupled with deep sequencing, so ChIP-seq, for, uh, for histone modifications and the uh, initiating form of RNA pol 2 So just a handful of marks, uh, but it turned out to be a very informative set. And so uh, what we looked at was H3K27 trimethylation. That's most often associated with repressed chromatin. That's those, these little red flags. H3K4 trimethylation associated with active chromatin, these little green flags. Um, K4 monomethylation and K27 acetylation that are, depending on, on, on which gene you look at in, in a static cell type, um, K4 
can be associated with active enhancers. These are these uh, orange and purple marks, and together have been uh, considered to be associated with, with active enhancers. And finally, our RNA polymerase II, which is act, uh, I guess marks would be a marking an active, uh, an active promoter. And so we did this during this time course of differentiation, and, and the, the, the important thing was, do it, was to do it during a time course, because we really wanted to understand not just how is a cardiac myocyte different from an embryonic stem cell or from a fibroblast, we wanted to understand how do the genes, how does, does this epigenetic regulation across the genome progress uh, during the differentiation. And so I'm going to tell you first what we found at the, uh, at the transcriptional start site and, and what we wanted to try to figure out, and this is where the, the computational people were, were absolutely essential. We wanted to be able to look at the combination of these epigenetic marks during the time course and see could we, could we find groups of, of co-regulated genes independent of gene expression, forget about whether they're making transcripts and what level they're making transcripts at, solely looking at their epigenetic signature could we find groups of co-regulated genes? And, and it could have been as simple as you've got on genes and off genes and that's it, um, but fortunately it was far more interesting than that. So I'm gonna go show you a heat map of, of the clustering that we did over the time course looking at these histone modification, these uh, epigenetic marks at the transcriptional start site. And so here's unsupervised clustering at the TSS to um, identify co-regulated promoters solely based on the chromatin status. And so what we're looking at here, I'll walk you, you through this. I've got a couple of complicated slides, but it actually the message is quite simple. So here we've got five sets of columns for each of the marks that we profiled. And with e within each of these, there's four columns that, that are the time course. So from the left to right, embryonic stem cells, mesoderm, cardiac precursors, and cardiac myocytes. And then the intensity of, of the color is the, the level of, of, the, of the histone uh, or the chromatin mark that, that we saw. And, and across are 34 different clusters. So I identified 34 different clusters that each had a specific pattern of, chrom of combined chromatin modifications. And the biggest cluster here had about 7,000 genes. This are, these are the genes that just stay on. And the smallest cluster here had about 18 genes, and you've got a number of different sized clusters in between. So we can stare, we certainly stared at these clusters for a long time. I just want to show you a couple of examples of things that we learned from looking at these. So we, we found different patterns. So here's, for example, in cluster five, you have these on marks at the embryonic stem cell stage, and as soon as you differentiate, you lose the on marks. Very simple pattern. Here's a slightly more complicated pattern where you have, also have on marks at the embryonic stem cell stage, and the genes gradually lose the on marks, but they very quickly gain the polycomb repression mark. And so, so there's, there's a variety of patterns that maybe tell us about how these genes are, are regulated. And so the next question was, was, of course, how do these chromatin patterns now correlate with gene expression? And so here, it's going to get a little bit more complicated, but it's actually very simple. What I'm showing you here next to the heat map is simply a, a correlation of genes within a chromatin cluster and within a gene expression cluster. So yellow indicates the co-enrichment of genes that fall within two, two different clusters, a chromatin cluster and an expression cluster. And so here's the, the two clusters that I showed you. And not surprisingly, as you might imagine, these fall within cluster A. Cluster A is the cluster of genes that are specific to the pluripotency stage. And so these include NANOG and OCT4. And when, when we look at this, there's a few things that we learned from, from, from looking at, at this co-enrichment. First of all, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can turn off a gene, that you can have a gene that's on and then have it turn off at, at the next stage. Um, the other thing that, that is interesting is that these pluripotency factors are regulated very differently at the level of chromatin. So they have a very specific way of being regulated. But when we look at other uh, chromatin clusters and other expression clusters, we find that, for example, for the genes that turn on transiently during the mesoderm stage, they only fall within a single uh, chromatin cluster. And, and so there's, there's a very specific way of getting genes turned on transiently during mesoderm as opposed to all the many different ways that you can just turn on a gene when, when you differentiate from, differentiate from the pluripotency stage. So what looking at, at these chromatin clusters and this chromatin status has told us is that in many, many cases, 
uh, the Compton status can predict co-expression of genes, but what was even more interesting is that not only can it predict co-expression of genes, but it can pr predict co-expression of functionally related genes. So within a Cromton cluster, we invariably found genes that function together in a cellular process, be it in, in cellular metabolism or in transcription or in contractile function. I'm going to show you one example um, of, of this that from, from which we actually learned something new about how genes are, are regulated during uh, differentiation time course. And so these two clusters here uh, that have about, about 70 genes within them are highly enriched for all of the genes that are involved in contractile function, in the, in the, the functional identity of a cardiac myocyte, its ability to, to, to beat, to contract. And, and so this, these are just the go categories of, the, the, of these genes, muscle, sarcomere, muscle again, cardiac muscle. And, and they all share a very similar uh, chromatin pattern. And when we looked more closely, we saw something quite interesting. So I'm, here I'm showing you a browser view of one of these genes, alpha cardiac actin, a gene that's been studied for, for several decades. And uh, what I'm showing you here are the, 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 uh, let's see, the traces for uh, each of these chromatin modifications, and then in gray is the RNA. So initially, in embryonic stem cells, cardiac actin is completely blank. It's not decorated by, by any of the, uh, the chromatin marks that we looked at. It's not expressing transcripts. And then, of course, at the cardiac precursor stage, when it starts spitting out transcripts, it gains uh, marks of active transcription. It's got RNA polymerase II. It's got K4 trimethylation. It does what you think a normal gene that gets turned on does. And then in the next stage, it's expressed at about two orders of magnitude more than that in the cardiac precursor stage. And that's something we'd like to understand. But at this intermediate mesoderm stage, what we notice is that prior to transcriptional activation, it gained these two marks, K4 monomethylation and K27 acetylation. And we refer to this as a pre-activation pattern. There's something going on at the transcriptional start site that is in anticipation of the transcriptional activation of the gene. Now we thought, well, maybe this is just one particular gene that's, that's doing this. It's kind of, a, kind of a weird thing. So we decided to look at all the genes in these clusters, and we found very similar patterns. So we found two major patterns of this. So here I'm showing you only the K4 monomethylation followed by K4 trimethylation here as an indicator of transcriptional activation. And you can see that there's two broad patterns across the time course of gaining K4 monomethylation and then gaining K4 trimethylation. And then when we looked within, within these 38 genes that, that had this pattern, we asked whether these, these, uh, these uh, sets of genes were enriched or depleted for cardiac genes. And you can see here in deep red, you can see that all of these are cardiac enriched genes, and they include cardiac actin, alpha mycin heavy chain, titan, troponin, many of the other genes are involved in cardiac function. So then we asked, well, what else can we learn from, from looking at these patterns? For example, if we look at the genes that gain the pre-activation mark but don't proceed to uh, activated transcription, what do we see? Well, we see genes that are still somewhat enriched for cardiac genes. We see genes that are like uh, muscle creatine kinase that you would expect in a more mature cardiac myocyte. And so this pattern is, is telling us that if we let these cells go on long enough, they would eventually turn on this gene and other genes as well that are involved in, in, in a more mature phenotype. So it, it really is supporting the notion that this preactivation is, is presaging the, the future activation of these genes. Then we thought, well, if this is the case, then we should also be able to identify genes that get the preactivation mark, but because they're not going to become, they're not supposed to be on in the cardiac lineage, are just going to lose it. And we, in fact, saw that. Um, several, couple of hundred genes that get the preactivation mark, but then don't proceed to transcriptional activation, and those are depleted for cardiac genes. They're genes that belong in another lineage, and since we're performing directed differentiation, these genes were told, okay, get ready to go, and oh no, you're not going to heart out, so you can just relax now and, and be off. And so, so what, what we think we've, we've discovered here in looking simply at these, these, uh, these temporal patterns of chromatin marks is that, for example, for, for these cardiac functional genes, they're initially silent, they eventually become pre-activated, and then that brings them into an active state. And this is very different than the de developmental genes that have this so-called bivalent state that have both active and inactive marks and toggle to active and inactive simply by the removal or, or re-addition of, of, the, of, of the repressive mark. 
And we'd like to, to pursue this and, and understand more fully how this preactivation uh, takes place. And we're using um, uh, 3D conformational capture approaches mm -hmm. to try to understand this uh, in, in an unbiased way. And so the flip side of, of what we've, we've been studying you with these marks is enhancers and how distal enhancers uh, may be identified and, and what we can learn from them um, it, by, by simply looking at their distribution and what genes they're associated with. And as I mentioned, um, H3K4 monomethylation, then in combination with K27 acetylation and a little bit of PAL2, uh, are very good indicators of, of either poised or then subsequently active enhancers. And so we looked at those throughout the genome. And we identified during the time course about 80,000 potential enhancer elements that were exquisitely stage specific. At every different stage, just like the gene expression patterns, there, were, there was these transitions of, of, of poise to active enhancers that were extremely specific to each, uh, to each, each time point. So we thought we could use this to understand um, what are the regulators of these enhancers during the cardiac differentiation process. And we exploited a feature of, of ChIP-seq where when, you, when an enhancer becomes active, it tends to displace a nucleosome that's in the middle of where transcription factors bind, and so you get a gap in the ChIP-seq signal. And so uh, with Lori Boyer's lab, we, we developed, or they developed actually, a, a, a dip-finding algorithm to look and see uh, whether we could identify these dips and, and look for transcription factor binding sites within, within these dips. And it was very satisfying to see that we could find stage-specific uh, transcription factor binding site signatures within these enhancers, and as well that we could identify uh, binding sites for the transcription factors that we expect to be there. So for example, OCT4 in embryonic stem cells, uh, LEF1 in mesoderm, GATA4 in SRF in car at the cardiac precursor stage, and GATA4 again with MEF2C at the cardiac myocyte stage. But what was specifically, especially interesting is that we were able to identify transcription factor binding sites for factors that we didn't anticipate to, to see or that we didn't know were, were involved uh, in, in transcription of enhancers in these particular cells. So for example, uh, LRH1, we found binding sites for in embryonic stem cells. And those of you who do IPS reprogramming know that, that this is one of the factors, one of the, probably the only factors I think that can replace OCT4 in IPS reprogramming. And at the cardiac precursor uh, level, we found binding sites for MACE1, the homothorax transcription factor, that had only very peripherally uh, been associated with, uh, with, with cardiac development. And so we focused on this, and what we noticed was that MACE sites were very often uh, right next to GATA4 binding sites. And so we found that, that there was a, about half of the MACE1 sites that, that we found in cardiac precursor enhancers were shared with GATA4 uh, bound in, or potentially bound enhancers. And when we looked at the categories of genes that were, that were predicted to be regulated in these enhancers, we found that not surprisingly as we expected, the GATA4 uh, bound and uh, regulated enhancers were involved in various aspects of cardiogenesis, development of, of cardiac muscle, and so on. So we knew that. We know that cardiac, that GATA4 does that. Um, the MACE unique targets are involved in sort of a hodgepodge of different cellular processes that, that aren't necessarily specifically associated with cardiac development, but the shared uh, set of genes were a very interesting subset of cardiovascular genes that, that, that appear to be co-regulated by GATA4 and MACE. They're also in, in cardiogenesis, blood vessel, vascular genesis, and differentiation. And so what this, what this computational interrogation uh, was telling us, it predicted that there would be a, a set of genes that are co-regulated by these two transcription factors that have never, had never been known to work together, um, and, and that perhaps either, either physically or by uh, some other means, these two factors might cooperate. And so we tested that on a, on a number of these enhancers. And I'll show you one example here, which is the, the myocardin enhancer. Myocardin, we heard uh, from Kim Cordes yesterday, is an SRF cofactor that's involved in both cardiac and uh, smooth muscle cell development. And it has this arrangement of uh, GATA uh, in red and a MACE in, in green binding sites in this, this broader enhancer that's been validated in vivo. We know this is a, a true enhancer. And so we tested in a luciferase assay whether GATA, GATA uh, factors and MACE factors could cooperate, and indeed they do. And this is one of, of many enhancers that we tested. I'm just showing you uh, as an example. And so MACE1 by itself can only very modestly activate this enhancer. MACE2 doesn't do much at all. GATA4 can 
fairly robustly activate this enhancer, but then when you add MACE1 to the mix, there's a very strong synergism between, this, between MACE1 and GATA4, which indicates that our predictions based on the computational interrogation of the enhancers was, was actually uh, validated. And so we've, we've uh, this is sort of where we're at in trying to understand this, this epigenetic regulation of cardiac differentiation. We're expanding uh, our horizon to, to understand all of these aspects um, of chromatin level regulation and as well to, to try to understand it, not just in normal differentiation, but in the setting of disrupted differentiation. For example, uh, in iPS cells from patients with congenital heart disease that have mutations in DNA binding transcription factors and try to understand uh, how how the, the altered dosage that causes these heart defects might affect the, the global epigenetic regulation. And we, I have nothing to show you at this point, but hopefully next year we'll have some interesting data to share with you. So before I, I stop and answer questions, I'd like to thank all the people in my lab that are shown here uh, that, have, that have done this work. Um, there, there's a lot of people involved, and, and we, you know, everybody really works together and really contributes tremendously, and we've ha had fantastic collaborators on, on all these projects. As I mentioned, especially uh, Lori Boyer's lab at MIT and her postdoc, Joe Wamstad, and the uh, computational folks at Gladstone. And I'll stop there, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Benoit. That was an excellent, uh, exciting talk. Uh, I have a uh, question um, about the pre-activation mark that yes. you uh, showed. So uh, have you identified any DNA motif for the bivalent chromatin that you are suggesting? Well, so in the pre-activation, it's, it's different from the bivalent chromatin. It's, um, but see, the the... the What's puzzling is that it's, it's, it's happening at the transcriptional start site. And one, one of the clues that we have about how it might be happening is that we often see a, a, a twin mark uh, distally that might indicate sort of a preactivated enhancer element that, that's distal to that. So we haven't yet looked at, at the, 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 the uh, pairings of, of the preactivation marks, uh, but that's something that we'd like to do. What we'd like to do first is really to try to understand um, in an unbiased way, without looking at, at, at specifically at binding sites, try to understand wh what the dynamics of the enhancers that interact with the, these preactivated TSSs are, and then look within those when we know where we need to look at, and then look within that and see, because obviously the question is, what is creating this preactivation mark? And we'd like to know that. Yeah. Thank you. So what does the, yeah, the question is, what does the preactivation mark actually do? And yes, I think, I think what it's doing is that it's, it's synchronizing the coordinated transcription of, of these genes. And so, so one, one might imagine that um, if you want all the, the genes that are involved in, in the functional identity of a cell um, to work together, especially in a cardiac mycide where, where all these things have to, have to assemble in a, in a sarcomere, in a contractile unit, and immediately function well, um, because the heartbeat is absolutely essential for embryonic life. Um, that you would want this to be extremely well coordinated. So as opposed to the de developmental genes that, that can you know, kind of go on and off whenever they're needed, these genes really have to be set into place and turned on coordinately at the same time. So we think that it's, it's exactly that. It, it's, a, it's a coordination mechanism. Uh, hi, uh, my question is also related to the preactivation mark. So based on your data, we know that a group of genes which are supposed to be expressed in the cardiomyocyte will get a preactivation mark. But at the same time, another group of the genes, potentially, they are not supposed to be expressed in the cardiomyocyte. They are also get preactivation marks. So the thing is that how the entire transcriptional machinery can recognize that, okay, the difference is between two sets of the preactivation mark on the different set of the gene and to differentiate that the set of the genes which are not supposed to be expressed in the cardiomyocyte are not expressed. Right. So, so it, it probably has to do with the, the signals that we're giving the cells. Right, so we're we're directly we're we're um, performing directed differentiation. So adding different cytokines at different at different times, and it's the same sort of cytokines that a cell within the embryo will see. And, and it's known that, that these signals obviously have intracellular and then intranuclear 
uh, pathways that go in and will activate then the subsequent transcription factors or chrome center modelers that are specific to, to that lineage. And so we think that it, it's simply because we're, we're the directed differentiation is intrinsically uh, activating the, the, the correct downstream activators that will then only bind the enhancers that are specific to the cell type that, that is being directed, in this case, the cardiac myocyte. Uh, and your data best shows, uh, I mean, you, you analyze the IC gene expression and also the histone modification at the same um, stage, I mean. But, I, I, but, but the, 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 the reason maybe that, I mean, you, you, from different uh, modules, I mean, for this, maybe 20 genes, they have the same histone modification and they have the same gene expression pattern. But, I mean, from that data, we can know how, which which is the cause? I mean, I, I have suggest maybe I'm feeling that if you can, I mean, for the different stage, for the fourth stage, we you can maybe you can examine the, the uh, uh, maybe different time points for the each stage, maybe uh, and also the chip stick data or other uh, epigenetic modifying enzymes, and so maybe give, give more understanding how this uh, process was, was regulated. Yes, if I think I understand your, your question, you're asking, you're, you're suggesting that because we have these very broad time points, mm -hmm. um, that, that it would be beneficial to, to look on a finer scale mm -hmm. to really try to understand the time course a lot better. And of course, we'd like to, we'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, to some degree, comes down to a question of, of, of sort of time and, and, and money to, to do these experiments. We would like to get uh, down to, to a finer sense. But I think more importantly, we'd like to, to expand the, the sets of, of regulators that we're looking at. We really need to know where the DNA binding factors are sitting. We need to know who they're interacting with. So, we, so we're uh, setting up proteomic screens to try to understand that. Um, and we'd really like to, to know um, on a more, more broader scale how the enhancers are being activated. So for example, using DNA-seq to, to really look at areas of active, active chromatin. And so we're, we're planning to do all these things to get a much a broader, more refined view of what's going on, but we just haven't gotten there yet.